Let's talk about one of the muddiest points that we often encounter as students in X-ray technology, um, and it is the relationship between KVP and contrast. So I'll clearly state it, and then I want to illustrate it, and then I want to make an arg argument for optimum contrast. So a low KVP equals high contrast, and that specifically should be high subject contrast, because in a digital age, image contrast is largely just controlled by the monitor or window level and brightness settings um, that the technologist can post process. But in terms of subject contrast, those um, that remnant beam that's exiting the patient incident on the image receptor, a low KVP equals a high subject contrast. Conversely, a high KVP equals a low subject contrast. And so we've done an experiment here, and unfortunately, the effects of this these settings doesn't fully translate once I've captured the DICOM images and converted them to JPEG for PowerPoint. But these are three different images taken at three different KVP settings. The mass was varied approximately along the lines of the 15% rule so that as we increased KVP we were decreasing mass and we can register that. This is a, done on the Fuji system and the S number which records image receptor exposure is doesn't vary all that much. On a Fuji system, an S number that is low um, equals a relatively high exposure, so this technique is kind of hot for this system, um, but uh, it doesn't vary all that much. Um, so maybe we didn't perfectly apply the 15% rule. Regardless, we've got an image on the left that has a low KVP and relatively high mass, and the image on the far right has a really high KVP and a really, really low mass. So. Um, between these two images, what are the effects of these KVP settings on the patient's anatomy? Let's look first at the image on the left, image 1. This was taken with a low KVP of 45. It has a relatively high contrast, and that distinction in contrast is evident in how much the bones stand out in relationship to the soft tissue structures around them. This is due to the fact that more um, linear attenuation occurred inside of the bones of the hand, um, so more of the x-ray was stopped by the bones, and uh, relatively little of the x-rays were stopped by the soft tissue. Conversely, if we look at image 3, which was taken at a KVP of 160, and has a high KVP and relatively low contrast, this is because the linear attenuation, due to the increased power of the photons, the average photon strength, more and more of the photons passed through the bones of the hand so that there was kind of an equal darkening regardless of whether we were looking at the area of the bones or the area of the soft tissue. This provides a relatively low contrast. It's a particularly apparent if we look at the edges of the bones in relationship to the soft tissue structures. So on the DICOM system that we were working, if we zoomed in on image three, it's very indistinct where the bones of the hand end and the soft tissue begin because the photons are passing through those structures equally versus image one has a very nice clean distinction between the bones of the hand and the soft tissue structures. Now there is another piece to this because we're not just interested in a uniformly low contrast or uniformly high contrast. What we're interested in is an amount of contrast that will guide diagnosis, which we'll refer to as optimum contrast. So image two of these three is the best image because it has optimum contrast. Well, how would we define optimum contrast? Well, we can't really act like this stuff is happening in a box separate from other things. So there's a significant patient care consideration when we're setting technique, and that is the effects of radiation dose on um, organic tissue. Using a low KVP requires a relatively high dose to, to have the same amount of image receptor exposure as, for example, a high KVP. And this also follows the 15% rule. So by using a high KVP, I can conceivably decrease patient dose. Um, Conversely, by using a low KVP, I'll have to increase my mass, which will also increase patient dose. So when we consider all these things, both the quality of the image, contrast, and the effects of patient dose, image 2 arises as the most optimum image because it has a sufficient amount of contrast to guide diagnosis, and it's taken at a relatively low patient radiation exposure. Thank you so much. Please like and subscribe to these videos. I'll be sending out more.